Um, no, but you could you could you could knock it out for like long enough that it would would be hard to bring back in the sense of I remember being at a, um, a very weird security conference a few years ago when uh, with the former head of cyber that's what he was called the head of cyber uh, from the RAF who were really super into um, into that they basically they're the people responsible for a lot of that for the UK. And he said there were three times that this country had been on the brink of like proper full danger in the last however many years it is if you go back to the Cuban Missile Crisis. So it was since the Second World War, the three most, the three biggest existential risks to this country had been the Cuban Missile Crisis, uh, Abel Archer, which was a thing that happened in the 83, 84, when, when uh, like NATO exercises in Germany triggered a Soviet response and we basically nearly went to nuclear war by accident. Um, and the fuel blockades from a few years ago, uh, when the truckers um, protested against the fuel tax by blockading the fuel depots. Um, because at that point, we were kind of 36 hours away from all the shelves going uh, bare in all of the supermarkets. At which point things start to fall apart really super quickly, and according to him, that was you know we were we were maybe eighteen to twenty four hours away from proper martial law at that point. That and he said the weird, the, the terrifying thing was only very few people realised that that was happening. Like even the the people leading the protest didn't realise how effective their protest was at the time. But because what they'd done was they'd actually they figured out what the most vulnerable points in a network were, and that's where like action can be done now. Um, but you see it every time like the, like the ATMs go down for a few hours, the kind of panic in that. Um, you see really interesting things happening like the fact that all of these new banks based on your phone uh, and how it seems that all the older banks are kind of happy to see everyone switch to Monzo or Doggo or whatever these, these new apps are to do your banking. And that's because the existing system is a completely huge, creaking, unsavable pile of messy code. <laughs> that is constantly on the point of complete collapse. And the only thing they can do is actually build entirely new sets of banks over here and move everyone over to them. Um, my answer, ramblingly, is not that you, I, like, I, it would be hard for anyone to crash the whole thing because it's very networked and spread around and is mostly about people's <coughs> idea of how it works than the actual thing. And yes, it's mostly probably pretty well backed up. Um, it is in genuine. It is an incredibly fragile system, though, um, and and no one, as we've said, has this kind of full view over the top of it. One of the things I do talk about in the book is um, uh, the possible accidentally ways in which it's been crashed on multiple points. There's a thing called the flash crash that happened a few years ago, uh, when like one day on about Tuesday afternoon without anyone really understanding what happened, the Dow Jones lost about 50% of its value in about two minutes and then bounced back completely to its high point again kind of 15 minutes later. And there's a bunch of different explanations for this, including ones that I, I didn't cover in the book. One of the many ones is that the, the system itself is using, there's so many different bits of software essentially plugged into this system that, um, that, that these totally chaotic outcomes are possible. So I'm while I might applaud someone taking the whole system down, um, I'm more interested in the, um, uh, the fact that we're probably more likely to do it by accident. And that's the biggest threat to the financial system. And, and when it happens by accident, we're in like real trouble.